happens is they start to seek bizarre manifestations because they want the fellowship so bad, uh, but they don't pay the price for it. They're not willing to trust the Lord with anything, and so they get stuck in a relationship that they're not really happy about. And so then false things start happening. Discernment really doesn't have much to do with knowing the difference between right and wrong. It has more to do with knowing what's right and almost right. And people that get stuck in this juncture, they always have a difficulty. They struggle. They want manifestation. They can't walk anything out. They crave presence. What they're really craving is a fellowship with the Lord. And they, they don't understand that you can go and do all these things, but it's not going to bring you fellowship. You're still going to be in a fractured relationship because like we talked about last night, perhaps there's besetting sin. I don't know. The centurion did not hope that Jesus would do something. He knew that he would. Jesus called that a rare thing. The other character in the Bible we find that embodies this foundation, the second corner to the triangle, is Simeon who carried the cross up Calvary. He carried the very burden of the Lord, which is what we are to do. The design, the plan, the heart of Jesus Christ is pulsing upon the earth. The Lord has one question, who will carry it forth to accomplish the desires of God beyond their own desires? We are to settle down and carry the burdens of Jesus across the nations, just as Simeon carried his cross. For years, uh, my church in Clovis, you know, they wanted prayer meetings really bad, and I, I'd never let them have prayer meetings. And you might think that's strange, um, but they were prideful. And I said, why should I give you a prayer meeting and then you're just gonna brag about how God answered your prayer? And they said, well, God would answer my prayer. I said, ah, that's the point. You shouldn't care. You should just come to worship the king. Because God says in his word, hey, listen, I'm gonna do it for my own sake. Do you actually think God is gonna hinge his entire plan on a bunch of dopey people who are lazy? I doubt it. Prayer helps, prayer works, but prayer changes us more than anything else. So years would go by, and they were sneaking around having prayer meetings. You know they were. But I wouldn't sanction it in the church for a few years. And then when I did, they didn't know what had hit them because I locked the door, and I said, okay, now we're going to ha have a prayer meeting. And you don't get to pray for each other. And you don't get to have a prayer request. You handle that on Sunday. Tonight, we're going to find out what Jesus wants and pray it here. And nobody is going to know about it. We're going to get the burden of Jesus. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to stay here until it's done. And they weren't used to that. <laughs> you know, some of them were having a hard time. I said, well, you wanted a prayer meeting. You're going to have to stay in here. Some were asleep, some were begging to get out. I didn't care. I was walking over them like they were dead bodies. But now, guess what? They know how to pray. They know how to intercede. And more than that, they know how to find out what God wants and pray that. What's the desire of the Lord? When somebody comes to you and they're ill, you have to know the difference. You have to know, is God taking them home? Because, you know, nobody's immortal. Sometimes folks die. Is he taking them home? Or is he going to heal them? Or is he going to give them a miracle? As a Christian, you're supposed to know the difference between those three things. And if you don't know it, it's because you have besetting sin you've ignored. If you don't know it, it's because you're not walking in your full potential. You haven't made your mind up about Gethsemane, so you can't walk Calvary. You haven't had your mind made up about what Jesus can and cannot do. The third character in this triangle of foundation is he's Cornelius. And Cornelius is an interesting character because he was praying to God, the Bible says, daily, oh, so much, praying earnestly. But yet we find he was not saved. And he, Peter came and he said, what do I need to do to be saved? If we don't have this attitude in our Christianity, we're not going to make it because we're going to always be hiding our sin instead of exposing it. Cornelius exposed his sin. He exposed his heart. 
he felt that he was a godly man, and Scripture says he was a godly man. He gave a lot of money, he gave a lot of time, and he gave a lot of prayer. But at the end of the day, his relationship with Jesus Christ was just that, a relationship. It was not fellowship. And the Lord needs us to come into fellowship and leave the fanfare alone. Because he's got everything. There's not one thing he doesn't have. He's got everything. You know, I was in Africa recently, and there was a woman that was, you know, she was demon-possessed and called her up. And uh, I called her up, and the demons began to manifest. The guy that had a hold of her was just praying all these weird things and just stirred everything up. Five or six people were holding her down. And I said, Leave her, let go of her. Why now, why would I say that? Because if it takes five or six people to hold down a possessed person, Jesus looks weak. That's why. You never allow anything in your life that makes Jesus look weak. So they let go of her and she was delivered in about 15 seconds. Done. Because the hand of God needs no help. The hand of God doesn't need you to feel good about it or bad about it. He just needs you to do what you're told. He didn't say do it because you felt good. He said do it. He didn't take a poll. He didn't take an opinion. He said to do the thing. And growth in Christ is that way. If we are not willing to forsake what we want, to embrace what God wants, we're just going to be common Christians. We're going to be those stupid people who can't do anything right. So tonight I want to talk to you about uh, being a friend of God. If you could turn to John, we'll get there and back. So remember in all these things, remember these these characters, the centurion, Simeon, and Cornelius. You can do studies on them. Uh, your pastors can help you out with it. It's very deep and very important. It's important for you in here that you understand this triangle of foundation. If you don't have these qualities, you'll get led astray. The Bible says in the end times that the very elect, if it were possible, would be deceived. Well, how is the elect going to be deceived? It sounds like a sentence that doesn't make sense. The very elect would be deceived because they're going to want more manifestation of God. They're going to want more of the presence of God. Because the old ways quit working. I'll tell you, if the old ways quit working, it's because you're in the way. So deal with yourself before you deal with something else. Our strength is directly determined by the amount of our weakness that we have given over to God. That's where you get your strength. If you are strong, it's because you are so weak and you gave it all to God. Don't misunderstand that. If you are weak, it's because you don't trust God and you're afraid to trust God and you won't trust God because God is not weak. God is strong. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight, God. Who are we, Lord? Who are we? Jesus, I thank you that we climb a hundred hills, Lord. You are there. If we go into the bottom of a thousand different seas, God, you are there. Lord, there is never a time when we are not on your mind, Lord. I thank you, Father God, that you sent the most precious one, beautiful Jesus. And you gave him a hard job. You made him a missionary. Father, thank you for that. And thank you, Jesus, that you came, that you do more than hover about us, that you walk with us. We thank you for such a privilege as this, to learn your word, to know your word, to touch your heart, to hold your hand. Thank you, Jesus, for not leaving, no matter what life throws at us. You are the constant, and we appreciate you, the anchor of our faith. Amen. John 15. Verses 15 and 16 goes like this. Henceforth, the Bible says, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever you shall ask of the father in my name he may give it to you back up for a minute we're going to dive quick and pop back out verse 15 has jesus telling us that he is letting us know 
that what he shares with us is only the things that the Father is telling him. When you have an impression on your heart that is for good and not bad, you can be convinced that it is coming straight from the throne of God. This is a mandate on our lives through Christ, but given by God. Now, this speaks of fruit. And look at it, it does not say just fruit, but fruit that remains, that is the gospel. If we're walking these scriptures out, we'll find very quickly that it isn't just fruit. It isn't just speaking. It isn't just sharing. It's powerful gospel that we are supposed to be sharing and giving. He calls us friends expecting that we will do what he's telling us to do. He calls us friends because he says, if you're my friend, your fruit will abound. Look at your life. If the fruit's not abounding, then you're not a friend of God. If you're just walking your life through, you're just making small things happen, and you refuse to get out of your comfort zone, then God would not call you a friend. I don't know what he would call you, but he wouldn't call you a friend because scripture says that your fruit must abound. We have to appreciate and respect what God's trying to do in us instead of running from it in anger. Take for a moment the difference between a friend and a servant. A friend will do something because they desire to do it. A servant would do something because they're paid to do it. It is their job to do it. When you're obeying the Lord because you are acting like an indentured servant, when you're obeying the Lord as a point of slavery, there's no heart in that. It's obedience, and that's nice, but the reason you're obeying is different than if you were a friend of God. I wouldn't want one of my friends to help me out because I'm so much trouble, although I have been at times. I wouldn't want them to consider helping me only because of obligation. I would want them to be endeared toward me. And the Lord is no different than that. The difference between a servant and a friend lies in the foundation at the end of the verse. Look at verse 16, if you would. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. The friend would do it to bless the friend. A servant would do it to not get in trouble. If you want the favor of the Lord as he was ordaining his friends, as he was walking about anointing his friends and his people, you must be able to know the difference between a friend and a servant. The Lord says here that you have to bring forth fruit. You cannot go about rebelliously doing the things that you want to do. This verse says you cannot be busted up and torn up. You have to be able to know what you're doing and know what God has called you to do. You cannot hold your opinion higher than God's. God's opinion happens to be bigger and better than our opinion. You cannot go if you love yourself more than Jesus. And Jesus says in these verses, I call you friend, go and produce fruit that abounds. You can't go if you're tangled up with yourself. And I think what the Lord's calling us to do in Corona is get over ourselves a little bit. And you may say, give me a break. It's a Saturday night and I'm in church. What else do you want? I want everything. The Lord wants everything. I remember having a meeting with a woman and she had suffered great loss. There's no doubt about that. She lost everything. And I was telling her that she needed to give the Lord every piece of her broken heart. And she didn't like that. She wanted me to encourage her. And I, to me, that was encouragement, you know. And uh, she began to pound on the table. And she said, what does he want? He's taken everything. What does he want? And I said, that's why you'll never recover, because you don't offer it willingly. You release it grudgingly. And she died a sick, lonely person, prematurely, with her fists gripped around the things of God that she designed for herself. If you cannot let God take everything that he wants from you, you might as well not give him anything. Because the things he wants is the things that are going to matter. Jesus wants to be able to call you his friend. And to be able to do that, you have to go to the next place. If your life does not have abiding, useful fruit for the kingdom, then it is not useful. If you are a servant, then you are not abiding. If you don't have a 
friend's heart toward God, then you are not abiding. And you'll come upon a day and you'll want things to be done. And you'll say, whatsoever I ask in the name of Jesus, and it won't happen. Because you didn't take the time to become a friend of God. It takes time. That's what I'm trying to tell you. It takes time. I grew up when, you know, I think that's why I don't really like Sunday night service. Because I grew up when it was mandated, you know. Sunday morning, Sunday nights, and it was like Sunday night was evangelistic, and I would think, well, why don't we just get evangelistic in the morning, you know? And it was religion. It was just outright religion for us at that time. Maybe not for anyone else, but for us at that time. But those people that went were worse off for going because they went for the wrong reason, do you understand? If you help somebody and you can't weep over them, you can't care for what they're doing and what they're involved in, then you probably should just back away and send somebody who cares. We have to gain the heart of the Lord. To be a friend of the Lord, you have to have the heart of the Lord. And to have the heart of the Lord, you have to come after his desires and pray those here and behave as he would behave. Years ago, we found a bird. It had a broken wing, you know. And we were trying to rescue it. You know, when you have little kids, you find these opportunities uh, to teach them something caring and wonderful. And, and this was that opportunity. And so we did that. But the bird the whole time was in our hand, was struggling, was fighting, wouldn't lay down for it. Finally, we released our hands a little bit and the bird flew away, limping, you know, falling, hitting things, very clumsily got away. My daughter that same week had to go into the doctor and she needed a shot. She was just as scared as that little bird about what was going to happen. But instead of running away, she grabbed my neck. She squoze my neck so tight as they gave her the shot. She didn't want to let go of her mother. And that's how it is between us and God. We have to be able to grab tight when we're going through something. Because when the Bible says that you will rise up with wings as eagles, this is talking about being wrapped up and tangled up with Jesus. It's a braid. When you wait on the Lord, there's a braid. If you're going through something, the Bible tells you to press into Jesus for that time. Not to something else. To Jesus. And as you press, press into Jesus, everything's made right. Everything's made known. Everything's made perfect. Because you're looking to him who is the author and the finisher of your faith. So last night, we started working on besetting sin. I'd like you to ask yourself if you have fruit. If your life is fruitless, you need to repent of that and step away from it. Your life should be full of abounding, amazing fruit. If people are not getting saved around you, you're fruitless. If people are not inquiring of the gospel around you, you're fruitless. If people are not getting healed around you, you're fruitless. If you cannot encourage somebody around you, you're fruitless, and you're just pushing a time clock. You're just coming because you're supposed to. You're just coming because you have to. The Lord wants to make a move on your heart. He wants to cause you to be a people that are friends of God, that have abounding fruit, that people will come to you and flood this place because they know there's help in that house. They know that. Amen? Would the worship team come back up? I'm done. Crash landed. That's it. I could go on, but why? That's a pretty good point right there, right? It's always difficult to speak this way because people, you know, they don't want to hear it. Because they're getting along fine just as they are. Getting along fine. But perhaps you don't know how great it could be. Perhaps there's something God wants to do in you that he can't do because you're stuck in this rut. One of the greatest problems we'll ever have in our lives is getting rid of comfort. We really just want to be comfortable. From the beginning of time, people just want to be comfortable. They want to claim certain things that they have no right to. They just, they just want to be comfortable. The comfort's a fine thing. But the Lord didn't call us to comfort. He called us to Him. And there'll be those days where we're comfortable. And that's okay. 
but that cannot be the quest and the pull and the call of our life is comfort. Comfortable Christianity is no kind of Christianity because when you're told to walk your hill, you will not do it. Reminds me of the story of Evelyn, an old blind woman in the East Bay of California. We had big meetings there and I was greeting people, you know, and there was this woman sitting in the very back and I thought I would go say hello. So I walked down that aisle of sanctified deeds and I came and I gave her a kiss on the cheek and I walked away. And the Lord said, I told you I wanted to hug her, not you, because I gingerly hugged her, stepped aside. She hadn't had a bath for a couple months. She had green mold growing on her teeth. She smelled like a combination of urine and whiskey and intense body odor. I've dealt with the homeless before, I get it, but this was, this was something else. She had crust all over her eyes and she had, her hair was moving, she had bugs in it. And, and as I slightly gave her a hug and walked up and took my seat, the Lord said, that, isn't what I, that is not what I told you to do. Can you imagine me hugging her that way? Well, no, I really couldn't. So I went back and I sat down and I said, Evelyn, I gave you a little hug a minute ago and I did it wrong. She was a Methodist and she said, oh, I guess you did. And I hugged her with my face on her face until the tears came out of her eyes and ran down my lips until I couldn't smell her anymore. They were calling me to come and preach at this convention and I wanted none of it. I just wanted Evelyn because Evelyn had God more than I did. And I just kept hugging her. I just kept hugging her. I just kept hugging her. She was blind and I thought maybe such intense love, you know, of course the Lord was gonna heal her blindness. But he healed my blindness instead. Evelyn remained blind so that she could go minister in only the way that she could. She was baptized in the Holy Ghost that day and I was changed. You see, the point I'm saying is, that's an old story, but I remember it for some reason. The point that I'm making is I always have loved people. I've never had a problem loving people. When I was a young child, I would see somebody with no shoes and I would cry. My parents couldn't console me. I would weep over people so desperately. I, I cared for them. My heart broke for them. I thought I'd already cared. And then I met Evelyn and I realized all I was wearing was rags that I really didn't care. I cared on my own terms. I cared as long as I had control of it, then I cared. But when God came in and he said, trust me, put some trust in the middle of the care, find my burden, ask me what I want to do and do that. That's where the friend of God lives. I don't live there all the time, neither do you, but we have to endeavor to live there more than we do. Amen. So find your Evelyn. Find the point of your life where you're willing to throw it all away. Give it all away. And don't ask God for the details because I find the enemies in the details more times than not. I spoke at a meeting last year and it was an outdoor meeting at, at a retreat center and they had this big beautiful tent. I had been there before and I, they didn't have the tent. And I, I said, well, the tent's great. You know, they said, we rented it just for you. I said, well, that's nice. It, gee, it goes so perfect here. You should keep the tent. They said, oh, no, 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 it's so expensive. I said, no, you're going to keep the tent. Give me the name of the guy that owns the tent. So I called the guy. Well, the guy said, that tent's $28,000. Now, at the time, my husband had been out of work for 10 months. Last year, he just went back to work. And I didn't feel like I was supposed to take the money out of the ministry. So I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do. But I knew that God wanted them to have that tent. 
Now it's a silly little story, but the point is, if God didn't get them the tent through me, he'd get them the tent through you. He'd get them the tent through you. He'd get them that tent through anybody who'd stay awake long enough to pull it off. So I called the guy and he said, well, the tent's 28,000. And I said, no, I'm not comfortable with that. I don't have any peace about that. He goes, peace? I go, yeah, I only do what I feel peace about. And I don't, have, I don't feel good about that. He goes, well, what do you feel good about? I said, well, I feel good about $4,000 and you pay half of it. And so push came to shove and he said, okay. We had a little conversation, me and this guy. So I thought, well, now I got to come up with $2,000. But, Mar you know, when you're out of work for 10 months, that's more money than it normally would have been. So I thought, well, you know. So I go to church. And this guy who does not go to the church came up to me and said, God told me to give this to you. And it was a check for $2,000. And they had their tent, and they still have their tent. And when I told the guy, well, I'll pay 2000 but I need a month to get it to you, he almost hung up on me. But I'd got it to him in three weeks. That guy came in from out of town and just wrote me the check. Because it wasn't for me, it was for what God said to do. You can't say, Lord, but I'm out of work. I can't, no, no, listen, listen. God's got all kind of people doing all kind of things. And he's talking to him all the time to accomplish his work and accomplish his will. And if we do what we're supposed to do and behave as a friend of God, then guess what? They'll encounter you. They'll find you. Amen? Could you stand tonight? I could keep going, but I don't want to take away from what the Holy Spirit wants to do. And I don't want any more preaching to wear you out. I'd like you just to bend your soul before God tonight, and I'd like you to ask the Lord what you're supposed to do to become a friend of God. You may be like I was, you know, loving everybody, and you're so nice, but then there's Evelyn. Then there's Evelyn. So I want you to ask the Lord what that is, and I want you to change your position somehow. Sit, stand, walk, move somewhere else. I find that when we're asking God to change something on us, that we have to physically change, move, do something to help yourself recognize this is different. This is for everybody, and I know this is a Samoan church service, but there is something particularly special going on, brother, in, in your church. And I, I would, anybody who doesn't recognize it is blind. Blind. And so we are going to continue to pray uh, for you. I would like all the ones that belong to the Samoan Assembly to come up here as we seek the Lord and I want to pray for you. God is good. Amen. Hug them till you don't smell the bad anymore. Can you do that? Seek out opportunity to be the less so God could be the more. It's not just on the mission field. It's here. It's, it's your neighbor. It's the one that takes all your time. It's the needy one. Those are children of God. Amen. I ask you to go forward in the Lord. Go forward in the Lord tonight and ask him for opportunities as we worship. Thank you, worship team. Hallelujah. Thank you, Ron.